I learned to hear Andrew Voss, who is a world class engineer and worked at SpaceX and also was my teacher at Astronova School. You also worked with Devisoft during your time at uh, SpaceX. So there are also a couple of questions about Devisoft. Would you like to start? But it's great to be here with you to connect again and be a part of your awesome interviewing. I enjoyed the one with Rocket Pi that you did and um, everything you've done with Dewey Soft is just super cool. Um, I think that's such a great opportunity. So I'm excited to see what y'all do in the future. I could just start with telling a little bit of my story. Uh, there were a lot of questions about just different elements of, of my experience. And so I thought I'd give people a little bit of a framework of how I got here and how I got to know you and um, some of the different places I've been and things I've experienced. I'm, I'm a 29 year old right now living in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Actually, I'm in Georgia right now. Um, I'm right south of the border of Tennessee, um, but um, I work in, in Tennessee and I live in Georgia. I got into engineering because I was really good at, at math and science in high school and I really liked problem solving and taking on complex technical challenges. I liked taking things apart in my home, whether that was like an old cell phone or an old uh, phone or uh, I saw you were taking apart your laundry machine um, or, or the dryer or something like that recently. And I uh, was just so amazed, you know, every time we went to the airport, I loved to look at the planes. I loved to look at all the space flight uh, that was happening. and. Uh, one of my favorite random things at the airport was uh, like the special airport fire trucks. Like said, most kids love fire trucks, but the airport fire trucks are the best around. And they would sometimes be different colors. And I just loved that. Um, so engineering was an easy choice for me. Um, I really wanted to use that engineering to, to help people. Um, and so I went into I went in to do biomedical engineering at Vanderbilt. Thought that was what I was going to want to do, but uh, my freshman year at Vanderbilt, I came across this, what looked like a missile on display in the lobby of the engineering building. Had a group of seniors behind it, and they said, well, we're the, the rocket team, and we're hoping to win NASA's student launch competition this year. Um, and so I was with my friend, and we were like, oh, this we got to do this. This is super cool. But they said, well, it's just for seniors only, so switch your, switch your degree to mechanical engineering and, and focus on your grades and come back senior year. So I think I was okay with that, but my friend would not take no for an answer. And so he stormed into the office of the advisor of that team and brought me with him. And he said, uh, is there any way we can be on the team right now? And the professor was finally like, okay, well, you can come to the meetings and sit with us and absorb as much information as possible. And you can come to launches and help us just set up the launch pad. Um, so we got really good at installing that launch pad by the end of it. We, we had, you know, really learned the ins and outs of, of rocketry and, and we were president and vice president of the team and it was just everything to us. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. But going back to freshman year when I was still in biomedical and I was switching to my degree to mechanical engineering, SpaceX was just starting to get national attention for trying to land rockets vertically to make them reusable. They were, you know, they were not a really well-known company yet. Um, they were just starting to get national attention. This was 2013. And one of the people from that rocket team at Vanderbilt had gone off to work for SpaceX. And I had just heard about the culture at SpaceX, how innovative it was, how much amazing work they were doing, the crazy things they were trying. And uh, it just seemed like a really brilliant place to, to try and do engineering work. And so I thought, well, if I put all my eggs in this rocketry basket of this Vanderbilt rocket team, maybe I'll get a chance at an internship and maybe a, a chance at a full-time job there, or at least somewhere similar. And so I, uh, I really went all in on, on that and switched my degree to mechanical engineering, decided not to study abroad so that I could get as much experience with the rocket team as possible. My junior year of college, right in May, like at the very last minute, I had applied like in October the year previously to try and get an internship with SpaceX. And right at the last minute, they called me from headquarters and said, we'd like to interview you for this position, this internship. And within a week, I had somehow gotten it. Um, I really didn't think I had done a super amazing job in the interview. A miracle happened and I ended up at SpaceX and I was just super happy for that internship. And I flew right from school out to SpaceX uh, in Los Angeles and Hawthorne. Right up until school started back up, I was still at SpaceX. And normally an internship is just 12 weeks, but uh, the second school was over until the second started, I was there. Uh, Cause I just, I couldn't imagine a more exciting thing to do with my summer than be there full time. One thing that was confusing is I had no idea what it was I was going to be doing at SpaceX. The title of my internship said Loads Engineering Dynamics, and I did not have the first clue what that meant. My interviewer had asked me one question um, about uh, something called the Nyquist Criterion, which is uh, the, the frequency that you need to sample a wave at, like a sine wave, to make sure that you get all of the peaks and valleys. 
And there's a there's a rule of thumb for that that it needs to be at least twice the frequency, usually two and a half to three times the frequency. But I didn't know the rule of thumb, so I just kind of reasoned through it in my head. I had not memorized it, and so I was just like, well, if you sampled it at the same as the frequency, you would just get a peak every time, and it would look like a straight line, and, and slowly work my way to something that resembled the right answer. And my interviewer really liked that. Um, so I knew they had to do it had to do something with sampling. Um, with data and things to sine waves. But uh, I tried to Google it and there were a bunch of different things online. When I got there, I asked my roommate and he said, oh, I don't really know, but I think they make the Mac. Um, and the Mac was something I would come to learn a lot about in my time there. They did make the Mac and that was that was actually the one of the smallest things they did. Um, but in terms of the team my roommate was on, which was, which was a structures engineer and RE as we would call them a responsible engineer, they were really heavy users of the Mac. Um, so the Mac was quite important to SpaceX on the whole, but not necessarily to, to my team. So everything I learned while I was there, I, I learned on the fly. Dynamics engineering is actually a pretty well-established field, or loads engineering. Most of the time it would call, uh, the job would be called loads and dynamics, but the order of the words, I guess SpaceX didn't put much care into that. In my internship, they had me doing a really novel project um, that where I was trying to build a little portable data recorder for transportation. Um, it was a great little sort of tinkering project for anybody with a makerspace, the design specs for that. And it was actually not really standard for what the, the people on that team normally do. It was just a great project for an intern to have. But I did a good job with that and they brought me along to other bigger things and I got more responsibility. And by the end of it, I was lucky enough to receive an offer to return there full time uh, once I finished my degree. They still had me they still required uh, me to get a college degree. So I went back for my senior year with a job in hand, which was just the best feeling in the world. SpaceX after graduating, we, we put all of our energy senior year into that rocket project. Um, we were lucky enough to win NASA's student launch that year. It was just a great experience all the way through. Um, I love the things we got to do. In the end, this uh, load dynamics engineer, what was your job? So it was a variety of different things. Um, there were probably 12 or 15 people in loads and maybe 30 people total in dynamics, which was a, a larger umbrella over loads. And we were responsible for everything that went on the rocket, um, not falling apart from vibration or shock or basically any type of forces that would cause the rocket to disassemble um, that, that vary with time. And pretty much all forces vary with time. Lift off big aerodynamic forces. Um, these things cause a lot of vibrations and oscillations and shocks on the rocket. Um, and the way the rocket and the different parts of the rocket respond to those vibrations is very technical um, and not really well understood either. And so anybody designing something new for the rocket, anytime we were flying a rocket through a new trajectory or a new flight environment, or we made any changes to things that the forces, the forces imparted on the rocket might be different. That came across our team's desk and we had to reckon with, will the rocket survive? Will someone's new satellite that we're flying survive? You know, is the satellite that we're designing strong enough or that we're flying for a customer, is that going to be strong enough to withstand the forces of flight? It was a huge variety of things, a lot of testing, a lot of analysis, a lot of data collection. There were times I got to do research. Well, one of my favorite parts is that I got to work with a huge variety of different teams working on different elements of, of rockets, spacecrafts. Um, I started with Falcon 9, then I did a lot of work on Dragon. Then I did a lot of work on the Starlink satellites and I just touched my feet into Starship. I, when, when I was leaving in 2020, uh, I joined in 2016. Most of our forward thinking research was either going hard into Starlink or into Starship. Um, and so I took on a lot of responsibility on Starlink, but at the expense that I didn't get to work a ton on Starship. Um, so some of the tools that I had built were still being used on Starship, but most of my daily attention was more on Starlink things. Um, and I really liked that. SpaceX had incredible office of really awesome and kind and, and bright people working on the Starlink project up in uh, Redmond, Washington, near Seattle. And so I got to travel up there um, and I just adored my time getting to be up there and, and working with that team um, and some of the, the advanced uh, technologies that they were developing for Starlink, uh, particularly space lasers or LaserCom was a novel technology that we had definitely had not figured out yet while I was there. And so we were hurling a ton of energy and attention at trying to figure that out. The work I did near the end of my time on space lasers, uh, particularly regarding something called Jitter, was uh, some, of, some of my proudest work. Jitter is, is on a satellite. If you've got a, say this little box here is a satellite. When it's up in space, there's like no 
forces acting upon it, nothing large, no air forces. And so nothing really to cause significant vibrations on it, except when little gizmos, little electronic parts on the satellite need to operate. For example, uh, these things called reaction wheels on them um, are constantly spinning to steer the satellite. I'm sure you actually already know about reaction wheels. The reaction wheels produce very small micro vibrations on the satellite, something on the order of 0.1 Gs. It would actually be considered bad jitter. Uh, that's important because these laser systems are pointing at each other and trying not to lose this this link across two two or a very long distance um, that these lasers are pointing at each other. And if one gets mispointed by just a little bit, they're going to lose their link. Um, you have a very small target, and so uh, any type of jitter on the satellite, any type of little micro vibrations, you can see my hand shaking just a little bit, um, will cause the mispointing to occur. And so uh, there was a lot of fear around jitter, and I was able to resolve some of that with with a new and innovative analysis method um, that was grounded in first principles and just kind of was a culmination of the the things I had learned throughout my my three and a half years there. And I got to work on that with with some teammates that I really loved. And I, as I mentioned, I love the Starlink team too. And so that was that was a cool opportunity for me. I did, did a lot of other things. Uh, yeah, there was great variety to it, but a, a large balance of testing and analysis. Um, and a lot of times we were just trying to take a traditional way things were done in the past um, that oftentimes was um, overly conservative. Um, so if uh, in flight, a part might see 100 pounds of force, we were designing it to hold um, 1,000 pounds of force, like 10 times over-designed. Um, because we didn't understand the dynamics well enough, the structural response, the forcing functions. Mm -hmm. and so a lot of what we were doing was developing innovative methods grounded in those physics first principles oftentimes better grounded in those physics first principles to get um, more accurate predictions for the loads or the, yeah, what the forces and accelerations of heart would see. And so, yeah, that, that was a lot of this basic story. I'm wondering if there was anything I didn't touch on. Falcon Heavy was in that time. That was an incredible day when we launched Falcon Heavy for the first time. Um, the first landing was between my internship and full time. And this, that was in winter of 2015. So I was back at home um, with my parents actually. And that one was, double the stakes because we had just had a flight failure on ascent. I think it was CRS-6 is what it was called. Uh, we were all expecting that rocket to be the first successful landing on a drone ship. And we actually lost it on ascent, um, which was just incredibly humbling and incredibly sobering. Might I say like cocky that we would be successful on this cutting edge landing reuse thing. And then to fail on ascent and lose uh, a paid mission for NASA, our customer. Um, have to stand down from launch for six months to try and figure out the root cause of the failure and make sure it didn't happen again. And so during that time of standing down, we were completely iterating on the design of um, of the Falcon 9 anyways. So the, the first rocket that landed that December, Flight 21, I think it was called, was a brand new design of Falcon 9. We had just come off six months of not flying um with a failure so the company would have survived a failure there but it was it was a really high stakes mission and so when it was successful i was just exuberant you know running around my house like crazy and um my parents were like you know what's with this guy now we had another failure um that that was also really shaped my perspectives at spacex which was i think amo6 is what it was called uh, we were fueling flight 29 we were fueling up the rocket for a static fire test. And so it was just a run of the mill test. That thing just exploded like boom, out of thin air, massive explosion. No one knew what had happened. Lost hundreds of million dollar satellite for no reason really. Um, and we had to stand down from flight for a really long time again. We had to rebuild the launch pad. And so those two major failures really framed just my whole philosophy of engineering, my whole philosophy of, of aerospace and and just, yeah, completely defined my experience because uh, it just gave me a lot of uh, soberness around the potential for things to go wrong, the types of things that went wrong, how to manage the risks on the rocket, um, just the number of risks we carried, consequences of innovating too rapidly, making changes, the importance of testing. Yeah, the importance, so much can go wrong, which is why it's absolutely brilliant that Falcon 9 has had so much success since then. Looking at the success rate with the launches and landings is just mind blown compared to the way things were when I was just starting out there. That thing, it's like a commercial airliner that you would fly on. Uh, just so reliable, ridiculously reliable. It's completely changed how we think about even what's possible in the aerospace industry. How you used the, the Devisoft data acquisition systems at SpaceX? We had one of the Dewey Soft data acquisition systems 
We used it primarily for modal testing. Might take a while to, that's M-O-D-A-L, but it's, it's putting many accelerometers and different sensors on a structure that you want to characterize the mass and stiffness properties of so that you can correlate a model and make better predictions of how it will respond in flight. Then you hit it with a uh, instrumented impact hammer. So yeah, you actually get to travel around the satellites and things or uh, spacecraft parts or rocket parts and hit them with a hammer on purpose to see how they respond. Make sure that your modeling approaches for that satellite or rocket part are, are accurate so that your simulations of flight will be accurate. And so we used the Dewey soft version. It was really easy to use. Uh, it had a great user interface and it was very portable and robust. And so that was, those were our preferences with the Dewey soft system. And so we could we could run a modal test really quickly with the Dewey soft system because it was it was portable. And we used it again on the, the rocket team at Vanderbilt. So we had another one at Vanderbilt in the, one of the laboratories I worked in, Laser Laboratory for System Integrity and Reliability run by Douglas Adams. So I was, I did one summer of research there my sophomore year of college. Um, and they did, they did dynamic sensing things too. And we did a modal test there um, on our rocket that we flew for the NASA competition. And so, yeah, I loved the Dewey soft equipment. Um, we use some things from other vendors as well. Yeah. I didn't have any problems with it. I think, uh, you know, accelerometers are very expensive in general. So anything that can be done to drive down the cost of accelerometers is, is quite helpful. Uh, but the system itself was easy to use, convenient, um, and adaptable. Gabriele Bikini from Devisoft Italia asked the bottlenecks in your measurements and the, the biggest challenges you faced when uh, you measured things. It's a, it's a great question, and it's great to hear from the Dewey Soft guys. Um, it's uh, it's just really mind blowing that you have this partnership with them. Uh, I think it's super cool. We saw crazy high accelerations and crazy high frequencies that we needed to measure them at um, and we would always there was there was definitely a range of accelerometers that could meet our sensing needs in different locations so the challenges i think were pretty traditional things sensor connections making sure that uh all the electrical connections were solid making sure that the, the accelerometers were bonded well to the test article or onto the the launch vehicle, you'd oftentimes just get bad data, and that can really mess with your your plans for developing, testing, and, and certifying the vehicle. Cost is prohibitive. Accelerometers are can be very expensive, um, and we were always trying to minimize the number we needed on our rocket. So anything to drive the cost down on accelerometers is huge. We definitely use microphones and things like that for acoustic testing, but that wasn't at my domain as much. And then I was I was starting to get really interested and, and started tinkering with, in some of the research I did, some of these digital strain gauges um, that were very reusable and just quick and robust. And I could slap a strain gauge onto a part and get digital data into my data acquisition system. And what was what was cool about that was it was a little bit closer to the things that cause a part to fail. The thing with accelerations, they can sort of lie to you. You can see 300, 400 Gs of acceleration on an accelerometer and think, oh my goodness, you know, this is the harshest environment ever. But it's not the case um, all the time. These, these very high frequency accelerations don't carry a lot of punch with them um, and they don't actually bring parts to failure a good bit. And so you can get a really, an, accelerom an accelerometer that's reading very high accelerations, but if it's not carrying a lot of mass punch with it and it's not operating at the low frequencies, it's not going to provide a ton of damage to parts. Whereas if you're measuring strain on something and you measure high strains, you know you're you're dealing with serious business. And we, I was starting to try and research and figure out is the are the methods and data acquisition we're using with accelerometers giving us sort of false positives in terms of the real strains people are seeing. Because what we'll do is we'll use the accelerometers. We'll come up with a, a static equivalent G load that a part would see. Hey, you need to design your part to 40 Gs or something like that. And then the analyst will go then apply a 40 G static equivalent structural acceleration to their design and, and check out the stresses and strains in the part that would actually break the structure of the part. Transferring from that dynamic space to a static equivalent space. It's really solid on paper, but in practice, you're not necessarily, you may end up really messing up um, how much strain you're putting into the part through that process. We definitely were far from having it all figured out, but I, I really liked those reusable strain, digital strain gauges we were using. Um, they were high accuracy, a lot of sensitivity. Um, and I felt like they really added a diverse perspective in my sensing my sensing challenges. That's that's what I would say about that. I wish I could give more information, but I loved collecting all that data and um, the times I got to use data acquisition software and get to analyze it and see how systems are, resp real systems 
are responding to dynamic inputs. Something else that uh, Gabriele wanted, that he wanted me to tell you, is to invite you to the measurement conference in Slovenia in April. Slovenia in April? Yes. Um, wow, that sounds amazing. I'll have to look into it. Not the easy, not quite as easy for me to get there as you. Are you going? Yes, I will be going. Very exciting. Yeah, the opportunities are, are quite immense. Um, so I'm glad you're you've got those good partnerships with them. You are one of the people who encouraged me to go to Davis. Yeah, I think um and, and that bring, that actually brings up something else I was thinking about coming into this interview. Um, as I was just thinking about like advice for for young learners and things like that, getting into partnerships and opportunities with real world corporations, companies, institutions, people that are operating in real time, trying to you know keep the world running or or innovate or, or bring us into the future, um, and they have to deal with cost, schedule, budgeting, and whatever we would call the real world problem solving. I think that's just radically important for kids to quickly see what that's like, because so many of the problems that we solve in school per se are, you know, they're, they're invented, they're made up and that's fine. I think it, it still exercises the right thinking muscles and physical muscles and conscientiousness muscles, but um, that nothing can beat actually getting a close loop between the students and the people solving real world problems. And I think you're doing that with Dewey Soft and it's awesome and it's hard to get set up, but I, I, I think it's great. Yes. It is. What advancements in aerospace technology are you most excited about? Recently, someone just posted a report on how the laser comm system is doing, the, the space laser system is doing on Starlink at some photonics or optics conference. And just seeing the progress they've made since I was since I left in 2020 and seeing those now up in space doing well. I mean, it is a profoundly advanced and capable system that I just think is so crazy cool for communication and just on the engineering side of things so i don't know all the things that that's going to affect going forward but i think that is definitely a profound thing that's now up in space that uh, has only been boiled up in the past uh two three years and and i think will have crucial impacts i mean it's already having a major impact for just making starlink a, an incredibly functional system it's it's but really it's, it's all about starship you know the starship is such an ambitious project it's always been spacex's orienting point of making human life multi-planetary the way it's being developed down in south texas really rapid build and test cycles getting into a flight like test as fast as possible i think it's super important the team learns a ton every single test you know people look at those and be like oh another spacex rocket blew up but people are expecting those to blow up and i know you know that but i don't think like the media or the public knows that these are very much development vehicles and each one is getting so much better every time but even then with a, a project of this scale with how expensive it is with how big it is a rocket has never been developed like this before this is very much that silicon valley fail fast fail often ideology that at times we used on Falcon 9, but SpaceX hadn't really proven itself yet on Falcon 9. It was still a little bit more, uh, I guess, timid as they were developing Falcon 9. And now that SpaceX is just, you know, the world leader in space flight, they have a lot more confidence. And so they're like, they can just take massive risk on Starship and go up and blow it up and go up and blow it up and hopefully not burn enough money um, that eventually it gets to be as robust and reliable as Falcon 9 is, which is crazy reliable. Like I said, like 100 successful flights, 100 plus successful flights, like 100 a year, um, I think is the number that, is it 100 a year? I don't know. There's crazy numbers of flights. You'll have to fact check me on those, um, those numbers there. Starship has so far to go until it's like Falcon 9. And this process will get it there. Launch, learn, launch, learn, launch, learn. But how many years will that go on? What will be the cadence between launches? How much will each failure cost? I'm really monitoring the abrasion between the FAA and SpaceX. It seems like most launches are held up by a, an FAA type review. It seems like the leadership at SpaceX, I mean, mostly Elon probably, are getting quite disgruntled by the slowness of that or maybe the bureaucracy of that. But these regulatory bodies are important, but I, I don't really know. I have to do my own research. Are they operating well? Or is it just, you know, Fooey, like I'm sure Elon thinks it is. I don't know. You know, Starship, they had hoped that Starship would be, you know, taking trips to Mars now, 2024. It's not there yet. Uh, it is a mind bogglingly awesome rocket. The last watch or the last launch I watched, uh, IFT2, I mean, I just had chill bumps 
head to toe. It was just so beautiful on that morning. It had great camera angles and the hot staging was super cool. And it just my excitement about it is so high. I'm so happy for the team there. I'm a little bit envious that they get to work on it because it's, you know, it's just such a cool project and I love problem solving with them. It really is all about Starship. And I think it's far from certain, you know, this rocket's going to be going to Mars anytime soon. There's so much work to get there. I want it to be going to Mars, but like, so much work has to be done and no one's ever done it like this before. And so I'm just watching that space really closely. There's tons of other cool stuff going on. So many amazing space startups. People are doing awesome work everywhere. The company, I'll just give a shout out to Muon Space doing like some climate science stuff. Relativity has a lot of the old SpaceXers. Uh, they're 3D printing rockets. I'm sure I'm forgetting tons of things. NASA is still cool. Some of my best friends from high school are at Blue Origin. When do you think that the SpaceX Starship will start going to Mars, or at least to orbit? Uh, so the, it should make orbit pretty soon in the next couple of flights. Next three flights for sure. Maybe good confidence that, or there's high confidence it could be the next flight, my FT3, which should be within the month. But uh, and then they'll start launching uh, real missions with with Starlinks on there. So that's a big advantage SpaceX has is that they can they can run these really risky development missions with their own. Starlink panels on there, the Starlink uh, satellites. And so if the rocket goes kaboom and explodes, nobody's mad at them except themselves. So they can accept a really high risk profile to launch their own stuff. Um, that's the that's one of the huge competitive advantages of SpaceX and Starlink is the ability to launch their own satellites. But the second they get one of these things into orbit, they're going to start throwing Starlinks on there. Uh, maybe there'll be one or two missions because the risk will be still be too high, but they can get it up to Falcon 9 levels of reliability on, on Starlink missions. But like I said, human space flight is another thing entirely. And the certification side of things will be just as scary with the FAA, with NASA. And you don't know, maybe we start flying Starlinks and, you know, maybe there's five failures out of 50. Uh, I don't want to fly on that rocket um, if, if I'm a human going to Mars. Yeah, it just really remains to be seen if, if all the kinks will be worked out. It's no guarantee. And I don't uh, I don't know what the culture is like at SpaceX now. I don't know if it's starting to, I don't know if it's as great as it was when I was there. Um, I hope it is, but Elon has changed a lot. Companies grow and they age, sometimes slow down a bit. I don't think that's SpaceX, but I would I would be concerned that maybe some of the changes in perception around Elon's leadership would change the, the dynamics up a bit of how the team operates. Who has been your rocketry mentor or have you learned mostly from just being in the team? Yeah, so there were so many just amazing people on that rocket team. Uh, basically, everyone that uh, was a part of that team while I was a freshman, sophomore and junior who was older. No one on that team like directly really took me under their wing. But the faculty advisor, Dr. Anil Kumar at Vanderbilt, is just a one of a kind man. And he's just so eccentric and so focused and passionate and I just loved every bit of, of being under his his tutelage and I made sure to take all his classes. It's a real dynamo. And uh, and so he was a very important figure for my learning at SpaceX. Uh, a couple people stand out. My boss, uh, Steve Ferger, who is now at, um, at Hermes, uh, the hypersonic jet company. Um, he taught me a ton of what I know and was patient with me as I was I was learning new things and really opened my eyes to just how great engineering can be done. Same can be said for um, for a lot of the people uh, who were sort of you know in in leadership roles over me at SpaceX. Uh, Kevin Wu was the director of dynamics, um, and he just really balanced well sort of the the technical side of things, teamwork, leadership side of things, the business side of things. He had a really caring heart. All these people had very caring and kind hearts, which is is is, is something you might not expect from a high capacity engineer, but that was so, so important. Bill Riley at SpaceX, just a, a prolific engineer um, who, who leads part of the Mars rocket now. Mark Juncosa was one of the most eccentric engineers I've ever known. Um, he was the, the VP of vehicle engineering, and I think he still is. Uh, there were two other people, uh, more, more of friends, I mean, but Antonio Gonzalez Valencia really took me under his wing right when I started. Um, and he had a master's in engineering, and I think he has just been more, or he, he's just a better engineer than me. Um, and I would say the same thing for, for Max Queenan, uh, who also had his master's in engineering um, and was also just so impressive as an engineer. He just knew so much. And same with Antonio. Um, and Max was my roommate. He was the one who I moved in with as an intern, and Antonio was in my department. But the, those guys have been such tremendous helps to me throughout my my career, and they were just so 
they were really good engineers. Um, there were so many times I felt like, am I even a real engineer? Um, it was good to have those inspiring people around me. Um, to, they were patient with me and um, taught me a lot. What were some of the most challenging problems you faced at SpaceX? I think the, the biggest challenge was was communicating between teams. Um, I think it was it was hard to earn the trust of a lot of the design teams. Um, oftentimes, since Dynamics is so technical, poorly understood, and, and sometimes a bit hand wavy or kind of empirical in, in the way uh, it's derived, there were a decent amount of engineers who just didn't have a lot of trust for what it was we did and so would kind of avoid our input on things. And so um, through through the leadership in my organization and through a lot of my endeavors through the four years there was trying to develop those relationships with the other teams, earn their trust, um, defend our answers as, as things that really were grounded in first principles, provide analyses and tests that were well aligned with the big picture of the company. At a lot of traditional aerospace companies, I, I won't name any, but Dynamics is like an entirely different building. It's impossible to work together with the other teams and people just throw answers uh, across a wall and you know hope for the best. Um, SpaceX, we really did collaborate, um, but it was still hard to, to communicate effectively between teams, getting other teams to communicate when something was going wrong, um, communicating as us when something went wrong. Those were those were all on the process side of things. Um, in terms of the actual technical challenges at SpaceX, getting a rocket prepared for flying uh, crewed astronauts was just a new level of risk that we had to deal with. It's, it's fine to take big risks when you're not launching people or when you're just trying to land a rocket. Um, but when you are going to launch people into space for weeks, at a time where failure is not an option. That's just a very sobering new ball game. And I'm thankful that that Dragon's been really successful. And the Dragon design was just also quite innovative as well. And so there was uncharted territory there. But everything that SpaceX has done has seemed sort of impossible for a while with the reusable rockets, the low cost private space with Falcon 9, the continual improvements that were made to Falcon 9, rapid reuse, rapid refurbishment, Falcon Heavy seemed insane. Oh, we're just going to strap three Falcon 9s together. We were all just, you know, biting our nails on that mission. We were very excited when it worked. It was just so, so crazy. And of course, you can see Starship now, which just takes all that to the to the nth degree. Um, Starlink, I mean, let me tell you, that design is just so innovative. Never been done before. The, the way the stack is designed to, to be just 70 satellites all basically ratchet strapped down together. Just spin the spin the rocket and fling them out into space. Crazy. Um, the government satellite people would come tour and, and, and look at what we were doing and how we were building them and their jaws would just be on the floor of like, like what is this? It's like um, you're doing it at this cost and building them this quickly and that's how you're putting them into space. Um, and then just to see how profoundly successful it's been, the Starlink network. It's just a really... A, mind-blowing and it's it's a great team behind it those starlink folks really know what they're doing and and really have worked hard to get there too starlink did not start off really on the great on the on the best foot uh with the, the what was called the tin tin program we had an, an, a design that needed a lot of changes question there are some from the rocket pi team how did you determine the shock and vibration loads that the rocket would experience um it's a great question from rocket pi the easiest way to do it is if you've flown a very similar rocket in the past and have flight data from where that part will be an accelerometer near the near the base of the part or on on a similar part and so you can be pretty confident that the flight environments that it will see will be very similar or what what you've seen in the past on a similar trajectory similar design you'll have to do some scaling but pretty simple things like that where it gets really hard is when it's a brand new launch vehicle or a brand new location on the rocket and there there you have to do um, what I would say are some pretty hand wavy things go into some technical papers someone's written 40 years ago with kind of these curves of scaling factors of how will how will vibrations be attenuated or changed in these directions and try and come up with something there and then all these things all these things you're gonna you're gonna validate with a, a finite element model that you run through a dynamical simulation so that that's a mathematical model representing the launch vehicle and you'll be able to pull out accelerations and forces uh at, at any place you ask of it um the problem with those is just they're they're very finicky we have definitely not mastered the the modeling process and so uh you want both the data to look at the flight environments and the analysis model and you want the analysis model to match the data 
Um, but neither are neither are even are really remotely close to perfect. So that was that was a very sobering thing as well. And then I see they also asked about how we would simulate if the system could survive the loads. Um, that was a combination of, of analysis and testing. Different parts had different requirements. Testing is definitely a lot more confidence inspiring. I think you learn a lot more in a test, whether that be a static test or a vibration test, but it's more expensive. It's more time expensive. The part fails that test. Um, it can set you back on the schedule front a lot. And you have to build a test article and, and run it through a test campaign. So you're trading schedule cost, time cost um, for having a, a more rigorous test. So it reduces risk more. Uh, often it reduces risk more. Lower safety factors. So you can reduce the mass of the design. Um, if you're going to just do an analysis to prove out that your part can handle some given vibration environment and some static equivalent load of acceleration, you have to use a much higher safety factor. That's called a qualification by analysis only it's one of the highest safety factors that we carried um, in terms of the design of the parts tons of parts did go through that because it's, it's not worth the the time cost to run them through a test campaign a designer needs to think about those trade-offs um, is this part complex and important enough that we need to run it through a test campaign and then how do we make that test campaign as accurate as possible and, and as low cost and schedule cost as possible. What led you to establish Tiger Team University and do you believe it's changing education? So I can talk a little bit about leaving SpaceX and going into education. So my time at SpaceX was from 2016 to 2020. I was starting to get into a very serious relationship with my now wife, Adeline, who was, uh, she had moved to Los Angeles and we were starting to sort of imagine life together and what our family life would be like and what we wanted from. So we were thinking that LA probably wouldn't be a, a permanent place for us to live. We wanted to be closer to family. Uh, we wanted to, to live somewhere with more of a community orientation, a slower pace of life. We were thinking maybe 2023 or sometime later to leave. Uh, there were some solid incentives for me to sp stay at SpaceX a while longer and I was really enjoying it and felt like my career was on a great trajectory. It was getting more and more leadership responsibility. And so we thought about moving to Seattle, but that would have been further away from family. We had both been to Chattanooga during uh, college and we had just loved our time here, experienced a bit of the, the magic of the city. So around that time, which was the fall of 2019, um, I was also starting to feel really, have some strong convictions about education um, that I had had some really just profound, tremendous, ex extraordinary experiences on this rocket team at Vanderbilt that were outside of the classroom. It seemed like not only that, but like everyone at SpaceX who was successful had experience on a hands-on team like this outside of the classroom. And SpaceX was just directly recruiting from rocket competitions, from Formula SAE competitions, um, people who had hardware experience on realistic real world projects that had, you know, complexities of manufacturing, scheduling, cost, performance. Um, they were very interdisciplinary in nature those people at spacex had these really good collaborative skills they knew what it was like to to communicate when there's uncertainty on a project they knew how to communicate when they didn't know the answer to something when there were big risks when they did something wrong they they knew how to own up and fess up when something was wrong and they knew how to see the big picture on a project too they knew how to to zoom out and see how their role fit in with the overarching goals of the project or, or the company in SpaceX's case. That was just night and day, I think, from people who didn't have experiences to develop those skills in a collaborative team setting on, on particularly a, a hardware-oriented project that had an interdisciplinary nature and a technical element for, for maximizing the, the performance and, and some of these business questions of, of cost and schedule. Uh, which are just always looming. There's also just the ethical questions, the safety questions, risk. Uh, anytime you're building something larger and complex, you sort of have to face issues with managing risk and safety and, and ethics and things like that. And I think that's that's essential. I thought, well, shoot, the normal classroom, you're just sort of memorizing things from textbooks and then being tested on them. And then you move on to the next chapter and you're just kind of going through this process of regurgitating memorized facts. Isn't providing the, the type of formation that our kids deserve, that that children really thrive in, that's engaging for them, and where they can grow up to be excited about the possibilities of using their minds and their knowledge and their understanding to solve real world problems and to make people's lives better. I thought, well, whew, you know, I started feeling called to leave SpaceX in LA and try and switch into education here in Chattanooga. Chattanooga seemed like to have a, a fertile environment 
for trying to develop a method of education and for me to learn how to be a teacher. So I told my boss that, uh, you know, sadly, I would be moving on and, and starting this new endeavor. And, and he was very supportive in that and, and offered to help in any way he could. And so I started to switch gears and think about creating an education startup, a nonprofit or an LLC or whatever it was going to be and learn, you know, what was going on in the cutting edge education, you know, who was doing good work in education and how could I learn from them and grow and, and have my own voice in the world of education. So I visited Ad Astra, um, which is now Astra Nova. I visited on SpaceX's campus and met Josh Don, and he was just incredibly encouraging of me trying to do what I wanted to do here. Um, and Josh Don is the principal of Astra Nova now. I know you, you've met Josh. We moved out here uh, to Chattanooga and, and loved it. The pandemic hit immediately, which was crazy. A lot of the in-person schools closed down. I had no idea if my business was going, my startup was you know, going to just be dead in the water. I didn't have any contracts to do any work yet when the pandemic hit and most schools didn't have time, the time of day for, you know, trying out this new educational program. Um, it was kind of a frivolous thing. You know, they want to know, can our students, are our students going to survive? Is it safe for them to come to school? And so that was a, a tough season. Thankfully, I got a, an email from Josh Don at Astronova, who was like, uh, yeah, we'd love for you to do an, a class here at our online school, Astronova. I think you'd really do well. And I said, okay, great opportunity. And so that came through and I said, yes, I'll do this. And I taught you and a bunch of other students one day a week, first educational experience. I started to get contracts and programs set up at, at many other schools here in Chattanooga locally. I started to work with people through sort of private one-on-one -on -one tutoring on Zoom. And I started to run summer camps, uh, boarding camps where students could fly into Chattanooga and stay at one of the local schools and then some day camps for Chattanooga students. So the mission was always to connect students to learning in sort of a SpaceX-like learning environment. I, I called it Tiger Team. Tiger Team was this term that NASA had coined in the Apollo era to refer to these small elite groups of problem solvers that they had thrown together to solve their toughest missions in the shortest amount of time. And we had some Tiger teams at SpaceX uh, to solve some of these really tough problems. Uh, I, I just interviewed uh, for my podcast, uh, Sanjeev Sharma. He was the first I had heard of it. Uh, he and some others were thrown together on a team to solve uh, Fracture, which was just unbelievably technical and figuring out how we were going to reuse these rockets. And they were seeing just insane environments on, on reuse uh, for the loads that they would experience when they were coming back through the atmosphere and the heating and the wear. We wanted to fly these things 10 times and it was just like a nail biter from an analytical perspective. Cause you're like, this is just so severe. You know, how damaged are these parts? How can we certify that they're gonna be safe to fly? We needed a Tiger team for that. And so I just adored that concept and that idea. I tried to duplicate that for students and that's what I've been doing in education ever since. Everything is project-based, collaborative, hands-on, somewhat open-ended, always grounded in first principles. I know that's a buzzword, but it's just so important is getting down to the fundamental physics of things. It's not everything. If you can't look at a technical problem and distill it down to some simple, some simple equations, simple knobs to turn and levers to pull and identify what the the biggest lever to pull is to make your project successful from a performance perspective. You're just sort of shooting in the dark. Anytime that's possible, it's so powerful. It's not the whole thing. It's never going to take you all the way. There's plenty of other things that can go wrong on the uh, process side, the relationship side, the ethical side, but it's, it's one critical element, especially for students to get to experience that for the first time, to optimize a design from, from a fundamental physics perspective and also see the limits of that where, where uncertainty comes into play where they have to manage risk, where they have to take risk, wise risks, has just been a grand experience for me. While all that was just, was glorious, I realized that I had figured out one piece of the education puzzle and, and there were probably, there were 99 more that I wasn't aware of when I started working with students. And so I really was seeking out a, a professional community, people that I could be with in person that could help me get acquainted with with a career as an educator, figure out how to handle just the the day-to-day -day challenges uh, that that students and teachers face. And I wanted to be with the same group of students in person every day. And so I, I when a job opened up at one of the schools I was working with here in Chattanooga, one of the ones I really liked, um, who had a solid rocket program that I had going, had great resources to support the, the type of learning that I wanted to inculcate in my students, I, I leapt at it. Um, I had to learn how to teach math. So I, I do have some pre-calculus courses that I teach there, mostly to juniors, but I teach my engineering course. That's my flagship class. And it's it's matured a lot since I I led you through it, um, a, a similar thing at Astronova. Macaulay's been a really fertile ground for me to develop my, my pedagogy. And I do have great 
peers there and incredible students I get to work with. I really miss you guys from Astronova a lot. One of a kind experience and just got to meet incredible people like you there. But thankfully, I still get to keep in touch with you and with some of the others who were awesome. And uh, that's a real privilege for me. One of my favorite bits of being in education is watching what you guys get into after uh, I get to be with you and staying in touch. Um, so thank you for offering. Thank you. So I, I'm full time at, at Macaulay now. I teach uh, five classes, uh, do activities where we're doing innovation stuff in our in our innovation lab. Um, it's a boarding school in Chattanooga, uh, boards like ninth through 12th grade, which is the upper school. And then there's a day school. You can go as a day student, as a high schooler, uh, or as a middle schooler. We have about a thousand students and it's an all boys school, um, which is an, a very interesting feature of it. I taught some really bright girls at Astronova. It's a shame that they couldn't come board it. Uh, it is great to, to be in person and, and get to work hands-on with the students and relate to them, eat lunch with them. Uh, some of the summer camps to help students get opportunities like that as well. You believe it's changing education? So I, I mentioned earlier in, in my story about why I started Tiger Team. Just I had had such a profound experience with uh, the learning on the fly at SpaceX. I was seeing the, the experiences people from SpaceX had had and I loved my Vanderbilt rocket team. And I thought that was where I really learned things was on that rocket team. Do I think it's really changing education? There are a surprising number of people in education doing really amazing work. Also, this Tiger team thing is not something every single kid needs. I think it's something an Eto needs or certain types of students who have certain interests. There is a massive diversity of students with, with different needs, different interests. While for, I can say for so many of our, my alumni, I've pr provided an irre re irreplaceable experience and program and shaped their life in a certain way. There need to be one million of me's in the world doing, making great educational experiences for different kids. Every kid truly is unique. Um, and that is just an amazing thing to wrap your head around. And so the, the teaching process has to be relational. You have to come to know the student. You have to come to see what makes them tick and and adapt what you're trying to do in the real time, especially if the world changes too. You know, I wasn't thinking about AI in 2020 uh, when I started Tiger Team, but now it's a really pressing topic for a, a student entering the workforce. Yeah, I'm thankful that, and, and a lot of people are doing similar things to what Tiger Team hopes to do. There's a lot of great project-based learning institutions, teachers, master's degrees, PhDs, schools, all doing great STEM project-based stuff. Um, so it's it's comforting to me that I'm not alone, it's comforting that I don't know everything and that uh, there's a lot of people on this same trajectory. What are the key principles you teach your students? Wow. The key principles I teach my students, really important is like a sobriety and a humility before engineering. Engineering is a something where you are, you have a lot of power and influence over the world is, is almost like you're you're playing God because the technologies we're developing give us so much influence. We're really zooming into the intricate laws of physics and nature to make something. And, and sometimes those things can go very wrong. Um, and so we, we try and look at all the different engineering disasters that have come when people have not spoken up, when there have been issues, um, when people have cut corners or been lazy or cowardly, uh, all the different disasters in space flight, some of the recent Boeing crashes on the 737 MAX, the Ocean Gate submarine, the Titanic, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, um, the Hyatt building crash. There's just endless numbers of horrible disasters at the hands of engineering that's not done well or conscientiously. And so I want students to, um, to take seriously the responsibility that comes with engineering. Trust one another, forgive one another. Um, I see so much students um, well, I screwed up so much as a t as an engineer, and people forgave me and gave me second chances. And if I didn't get a chance to to mess things up or try something and fail or challenge myself in a way where I knew I wasn't going to be, um, I wasn't going to come through with a perfect product and have people around me that were going to support me regardless, I would have not ended up where I am. So I, I try and you know teach them to take a deep breath, to be forgiving, to grow more comfortable with uncertainty. Um, to zoom out and see the big picture of their project, including the big picture of their teammate as like a, you know, a human being um, who who's as important as the thing they're trying to create. Yeah, I want them to learn to take wise risks. I, of course, want them to grasp physics equations and engineering equations and the technical side that would allow them to optimize the design, um, see the people in their community that need the most help. Um, those who just necess can't necessarily help themselves or speak for themselves or, or who are living with 
disabilities or are living in an oppressed condition. Um, I want to orient their eyes towards towards where there's the highest need, not necessarily where there's the highest amount of money or the most impressive job. I, I obviously want them to be enthusiastic and passionate, try and bring to the table. Um, I want them to listen well to others, be empathetic. Uh, so, so much of it is about the process uh, over just the product. So much of it is about character over just content. Um, I really, I'm, my, my goal is to get into the heart of engineering. Both the human element, the relational side of things, and the technical side have to be emphasized. And I think oftentimes just the technical side is emphasized, and that won't do. That's not that's not Tiger Team. What was a memorable moment for you when you were teaching at Astro Nova School? Well, I think oftentimes you would call in and you had done some experiment and you would show us some, some rocket you built in your basement or something that's on fire. I think, uh, yeah, times like that where I gave a lot of freedom to students to develop a project, experiment with it and not have a lot of constraints. Um, that was one of the big advantages of Astro Nova. Uh, they gave a ton of freedom to me as a teacher. They didn't burden me with a lot of, uh, you know, learning targets that you have to hit. They didn't have grades or things like that. It was all about trying to create experiences for, for you students to be creative and to grow. Um, seeing times that students did that in my class. I remember a student in, in May of 2021, they flew me out to LA to launch rockets in the desert with some of the students. And I had students who pulled out sort of this cold gas thruster with a solenoid valve. I think it was Leopoldo Gastel. It was just incredible to see the things that students made, some of the joy that students brought to the teams. Yeah, oh gosh, there were some great team names. Trying to remember some of those. Yeah, being out in the desert with everybody in uh, in LA was was a very memorable experience. Uh, my buddy, my one of my other old roommates, Quinlan, like drove me out to the desert like three hours with me and these kids in his van. He's got this like big blue van, and it was just a crazy thing to be back out there with the SpaceX folks doing that. What advice would you give us students that are entering in the field of rocketry? I think that's a, that's a great question. It's a very important one. It's a lot of different things. I think one is seek seek out challenges for yourself, seek out environments where you can be challenged, things that really seem nearly impossible, or you look at them and you're like, how in the world would I do that? But I wanna do it. I think seeking out challenge is, is essential. And the key to doing that is, is being in a place where uh, the stakes are pretty low, where you can take on one of these seemingly impossible things, be allowed to fail and learn from that failure. Um, be, be in an, a, a huge feature of this is the people around you too. Um, a supportive environment that will let you fail, will help you back onto your feet, will not, you know, shame you for being a failure of some kind, or who will, yes, yeah, support you as you experiment through things that are really challenging, technically challenging, especially there's concepts that you, you really have to fight to wrap your head around, especially on the engineering side. I think my advice would be even in your normal classes, your math classes, your English classes, uh, history classes, if there's something to you that's really challenging, Challenge is good for its own sake. And I think learning is really good for its own sake. I feel like I wish I had taken all of my classes more seriously when I was growing up and, and in high school and I would be better off now for it. But uh, especially with the engineering stuff, um, with some of the technical equations that underlie a lot of these technologies, really fight hard to understand it. Really make sure that you have your head wrapped around it and then find places where you can apply those things. Super important is surrounding yourself around great people. Find, find a, a community of, of thinkers, of, of engineers, um, where you just love the energy there, where people are, are kind to you, where you can be kind to them. Regardless of the environment, always be kind to everyone. Um, there's never an excuse, there's never an engineering excuse uh, to be rude or dismissive to someone, even if they don't have any help to you in developing your technology, or maybe they're getting in the way of developing whatever you're trying to develop but that is never an excuse to look down on someone or be rude to them or judgmental of them. Um, that's a common mistake I think engineers can make just because engineering does give us so much power and is so technically difficult. But look for that good, wholesome, caring environment of people who are passionate, who are thinking well, who are really getting after it and are embracing challenge and embracing discomfort. Um, I think getting uncomfortable and chasing good challenges, things that seem impossible. I think that is what it's all about. Finally, just on like the pure aerospace engineering side is like one of the things that I think is most important for engineering is especially with a new design is getting getting that design into a what I would call like a flight like test configuration for a, a flight like test uh, as quickly as possible. I think you learn so much from sort of real world testing of a design so much more than sitting around trying to, to well, pencil push it to death 
um, and, and try and figure it all out just on paper. Um, if you can build something quickly and be reflective about what's going well and what's not going well, I think that is absolutely essential. Just a really good piece of advice. I would share actually my old boss, Steve Berger, he would say, work the right problem adequately and not the wrong problem well. That's good advice. I would say that since you're losing your voice, as you say, it's uh, we can end the interview, except if you want to say anything else. I think that's good for me. Um, thank you so much for doing thank this. Thank you for coming. A good time. If anybody else wants to reach out to me, they can, they can LinkedIn message me or something or send questions over to you and I'll try and answer. Keep up the good work. If Dewey Soft wants to give me any stuff for educational purposes, I, I'm, offer, oh, I'm offering a new advanced engineering course at Macaulay um, where I will definitely want to do some more technical things. And I think introducing some students through two dynamics, through the lens of modal testing or dynamic testing, uh, working with accelerometers, string gauges, mics, the Dewey Soft system would be great for that. Good opportunities everywhere. Thank you for joining. Yeah, keep up the great work. Um, Thank you. I will see you. I will see you around soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.